hope this finds you well. If you're new here, my name is Kat. It's lovely to meet you. If you've been here before, it's nice to see you again. As is the case when I'm not doing a more traditional, if there's such thing, knitting podcast. I'm doing something a bit newer to me, something that I am... I think I do so that I have a, a way of learning and reinforcing what I've learned, but also to encourage other people to try different crafts, you know, be creative. Um, so I'm, I'm not here as an expert, I'm here as showing you how I managed to learn and I've got one, two pieces that I'm really, really happy with, um, which I honestly didn't expect to have so quickly on my needle binding journey or nail bending journey. There are lots of spellings and lots of pronunciations. I will say now binding just for ease. It's what feels most natural to me. And yeah, I guess up front, I have myself a matcha with uh, ginseng and licorice. It's something that I very much enjoy. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't fancy a coffee, but I did think I needed a little boost today. Um, it's very muggy. We are due a storm this afternoon and it's really feeling like it's a necessary thing. So I've got a cup of tea, matcha. Um, what else? Oh, I'm wearing my golden oak top by Amanita Knits. I will pop the link in the thing down below. And it is, uh, the golden oak, oak tank is a pattern that I really like. I've knitted it twice. I would be glad to knit it again. I used, it's an Auspaca silk blend from hobby of all places they sent me some yarn to try a couple of years ago um i really like this um yarn it's nice in the top it is maybe a touch warm for a summer item because of the alpaca but i'm really enjoying wearing it and it's actually quite the perfect temperature inside the house for it today that is the upfront stuff i think so i'm going to talk about needle binding or nail binding and it is a craft that I've wanted to try for quite some time. I actually purchased a needle a couple of years ago, I think, and I I don't know that I really even tried it. I just had it and it kind of got a little bit nervous. I was so comfortable with knitting, it kind of felt like, really? I just, I wanted to try it because I wanted to try a historical craft. I really enjoy a a slower based project. I do enjoy learning a new skill and I thought I would do it sooner but for some you know reasons um, I never got round to it and I finally have and I've really enjoyed the process so far. It is the precursor to knitting and crochet. Uh, there's, there's talk that it's definitely hundreds of years previous but potentially thousands? Hmm? Thousand? Um, Finland seems to be a rare place in that they have practiced it almost continuously since they started. So that's quite cool, got an unbroken practice, whereas I feel from what I was reading, it, it kind of ebbed and flows. In the 1950s, it was a craft that kind of almost went, was endangered. What is endangered? It, but it was endangered until around then. And now in the Viking reenactment, Kind of community it's become well i don't think there's any risk of it being lost which is great because it would be a shame to lose this i do want to do some more reading on this i've seen a few books that i would quite like to spend some time with i am trying to see if i can get hold of them from the library our local library is quite good generally at getting books in from across the country if i need to need or want to read them it's like a 50p reservation fee which is very reasonable i would recommend doing some reading yourself if you are interested in the history there's plenty of information out there um, there's some quite cool um, archaeological finds that are worth having a little look at you can see both fragments and mostly whole items most of the finds tend to be socks and caps and gloves and mittens and it is a really good craft for making those items. The The way you um, increase and decrease and do shaping much like crochet is very similar. 
so I think where you can be feel it feels a lot more free with crocheting in terms of you know increasing as you go decreasing as you go trying stuff out um, which I feel like you can do with knitting but I think a lot more people find it a lot more intuitive when it comes to crochet I think it, for me and my experience so far it is very much like that so you can make a glove or a mitten and just keep trying it on increasing as you need to decreasing as you need to um, with quite a lot of success it uses one needle I haven't said that yet but it, it uses a single needle um, I, you could probably do this craft without the needle I am quite I have gangly fingers I've spoken about this before I've got very large hands for my size um, I was with lovely Marina of Marina Skewer podcast who is about a foot taller than me all weekend and um, my hands are maybe the same size maybe even a touch bigger I have really big hands um, but I think having a, the needle is sensible for me they vary in size and they vary in what they're made from this one is a bone needle um, there's vines in all kinds of material from what I understand bone horn wood I think there's even some bronze and iron examples I'm not sure how small or large they would go down to but they vary in terms of roundness flat some of them are flat um, how sharp they are how blunt they are I think this is quite a good middle ground yeah so that's the needles they come in they're quite easy to get hold of I am looking to make some this I purchased because I knew it would be smoother than anything that I could potentially make at least to begin with now Alex has a lovely whittling knife I'm hoping to get some wood locally and make a slightly smaller one and try making a one about the same size but just flatter um, because I really want to try different different techniques different stitches oh hello Audrey do you want to come say hi? Mm, she's thinking about it. If you're new here, Audrey is the in-house kitten. She is a lovely little cat that often joins us. Uh, and, and I get quite distracted by her in the nicest way. She's just, she's just so lovely. I love her. Oh, you cheeky tinker. Audrey. So I watched a few different tutorials when I was figuring out how to do this, this lovely skill. Um, I will link a few of the ones I found most useful in the description. But the they varied between using your thumb and not. So when you are kind of sizing your stitches, you're making them using your thumb. I think that the sheer size of my... Oh, Audrey's trying to get my drop spinning. You tinker! I don't blame you, it's lovely. I did just manage to rescue it before she subjected this lovely fibre to any more <laughs> trauma. It has been with me to Norway, it came to unravel with me. Um, this is a Bosworth spindle, I'll just talk about it quickly because I've shown it. Uh, I'm spinning a Manx and silk blend and I now have a project in mind for it and I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, we're getting there on it. Um, I just need to protect it from being matted anymore. The fibre is from Felview Fibres and Carol is amazing. She does gorgeous blends. She does very, very careful carding um, and prepares the fibre in any way you could possibly want, from row lags to bats to gradients. It's very cool. You cheeky. Yes, so there are methods of doing it with the thumb, off the thumb. I prefer off. I just think that the stitches would be too large unless I was using a much thicker wool. And I'm not someone that's generally drawn to chunkier yarns, which is bizarre because I do knit a lot of larger needle projects, but I just really like a flowy, drapey item. So it makes sense, really. I will show you how I do it. It's definitely not there's thousands of different methods much like knitting or crochet there's many methods of getting the same result this is just the one that I found to really stick with me and 
correct or not it works and I'm very happy with the results that I'm getting. There are thousands of types of stitches I think, maybe it's more like a thousand but from what I've seen and read it produces quite a dense fabric which makes it very durable, very strong, perfect for when it is cold. It also doesn't break so if you put a hole in it because while it's not a actual knot it is essentially knotted fabric so, so you know if you've got a the ball of your foot is quite hard wearing it's quite a good method of making socks when it comes to nail binding you can do super fine if you wanted you just use a smaller needle or pull the stitches tighter or a little bit looser i definitely started a little bit looser and on uh, with slightly chunkier yarns um, but would will definitely be moving down a little bit and doing something a bit finer in the future generally wool is best because you can felt it so unlike knitting or crochet where you're working from you know a, a ball of yarn or a skein of yarn or a hank of yarn whatever you're working from um, you actually work in lengths so really if you do not want to add lots of knots into your project being able to use wool and splice it together is a really great way of joining the lengths without any visible join and not having to weave in lots of ends use the split splice <laughs> I always struggle with it when I'm on a camera split splicing method and it also means that you can just tear your yarn uh, which is best because it gives you these lovely floofy bits at the end which will then felt together nicely. I've found so far that a woolen spun is better and easier purely from being able to felt the ends together a little bit easier and it like fluffs up into itself so even if you're not knotting the fabric into a dense stitch it does fill up the holes so it's it becomes quite dense anyway to be historically accurate if you wanted to do that you could definitely use undyed or dyed fibers um, natural dyes being the the way to go uh, there is examples of both undyed projects and projects that feature either little parts of dyed yarn or st striped yarn even, like not not self-striping yarn but using stripes and because you're working in lengths it's very easy to just change colour as often as you wanted which and something that's come to my mind is if you're like me and you love working with woolly wool but you're reluctant to get rid of those little bits of wool from projects those little five gram balls this is a really fun way of using up all of those bits you could put them into a blanket which is something I've been thinking about or Sorry, Audrey's eating. Um, I hope that hasn't affected the last bit. I will pause and wait for her to finish so that <laughs> you're not enduring that sound. She, <laughs> little Audrey is sat down here. I'm not gonna look at her because she's gonna. She's just giving the, the, the look. She's like, you're talking to yourself again. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm talking to, I'm talking to you, you lovely watcher. Um, <laughs> the, while wool seems to be from what I've seen, again this is all kind of from my memory, um, but what I've seen is wool was predominantly used. There are examples um, of silk being used for headbands and caps if, I'm, if I remember rightly. And that's something I would love to try. Um, I think silk is a, it's a beautiful fibre. Silk's a whole different kettle of fish if you will, so I'm not going to go into silk. but. It's a fibre that I really love working with and I would love to but I think if I'm gonna use silk in a project especially now I do want to first of all learn some more stitches and figure out what something more decorative maybe than the, the York stitch which is what I will show you how I'm doing um, but also something with a bit more finesse, so something finer um, and a, the right project for it. So for now, while I'd love to try silk, it's kind of been put to the side. We'll 
we'll kind of exhaust or get as much as we can out of using the wool that I have before stepping into that realm, which I think would probably have been for the slightly more noble people anyway. You can do this flat, you can do this in the round. I feel like in the round is a bit easier, which is quite cool, um, but you could, you know, from hats, caps, socks, mittens, gloves, you could make anything that you can crochet or knit quite comfortably. It. I know a lot of people were put off because they think it takes a lot longer and I don't know. It definitely takes a little bit more time, but I wouldn't, it's not excessively longer. It's not wildly longer. In fact, I think you could whip up a hat quite quickly or mittens and gloves if you used thicker yarn. I think you could, you'd do it in about the same time. I don't, it is a little bit slower, but not not much is what I'd say. If you have patience to knit, you can definitely have patience to nail bind if it's something you wanted to try or do. I would say I decided to learn using a gorgeous yarn that was hand spun. And while I really enjoyed it, I'll show you. This gorgeous fibre was spun as a hey we've met for the first time gift from my lovely friend Mary who goes by Mary Dittle Makes and it is 100% Masham and it's one of her first spun projects. It's gorgeous. The weight is it's a probably an Aran weight. It is so 95 metres per 100 grams. I think it's beautiful. But what I would say is maybe don't try and learn on hand spun. You could if you if you've this if you know if you're a very skilled spinner and you've got lots of consistent yarn, definitely go ahead and do it with your hand spun. I think these this is a beaut. There's so many just like noises out there today. Um I tried to learn using hand spun. In fact, I did just learn using hand spun. I would say unless you have been spinning or an, an experienced enough spinner to have a very consistent yarn, maybe don't opt for a hand spun. Um, I would opt for something more commercial, something that has a very even ply to it, very even twist to it. Whether that has a low twist or high twist, I would say between the middle and lower might be better because it tends to, at least York Stitch, I haven't experienced any of the others, have a really significant bias to it and that can be a little bit off-putting, confusing, uh, until you've got a little bit used to reading the stitches, much like learning to cable, much like learning to do lace work. It just takes a bit of time getting used to. It's not difficult, it's just learning to read a new craft. And I, I think that's really fun. It's a really exciting part of it to me. Maybe that's just me. And also what I would say, it's very gentle on the hands or it has been for me. And I don't know if that's because I am quite conscious of not, you know, doing something silly and constantly doing the same movement. I'm quite gentle and I try and keep my wrists looked after quite straight. Um, but that's something to consider if you're someone that does quite a bit of knitting or crocheting and doesn't take breaks do recommend but also wants to carry on doing crafts switching up crafts is a really great way of doing so but um obviously take breaks please hydrate um i go on about it quite a lot but i i feel like if we want to do it long term and as much as we all want to knit loads <laughs> um just looking after our hands will mean that we get to do it for longer. Unfortunately, my grandma doesn't knit because she did kind of abuse her fingers a little bit too much. And I don't want to see other people do that. Um, but yeah, I find that it's super gentle on the hands. I can now do it on the go. It, I do need to still look just to check that I've got it in the right holes. 
but once you're doing it then you're just like oh I'm done do, do. oh I can look away so it's quite good if you're at home maybe watching television um, and this is something that um, I know people have partners that they would quite like to get into crafting with them this is another one that I think's super easy and if you wanted to you know if your partner showed an interest in a fiber craft but didn't want to knit and maybe has an interest in historical items or this is a really good one because you could just set them off with a tube um, to begin with that they can just keep practicing the stitch and then they'll have most of a hat and then teach them how to decrease um, and they've got an item and and it's a nice one for sitting watching television with or you know in the park it's quite something you can take small amounts with you so if you sorry I just love it I'm so impressed with it as a, a skill but if you're going say just walking to the park or going to a friend's house but you know just for a meal and you're not sure if you're gonna stay and hang out for a little bit after or not um, because you generally the projects aren't large so unless you decide you want to make a garment which I'd love to try it uh, but if you made a garment you'd need more if you used, wanted to make a blanket you'd need lots more but you could just take you know a hat and a hat's always a small project anyway but you could just take 10 lengths of yarn so you've only got a couple of grams of fiber in your pocket and your needle like it doesn't take much and I found that I could hook my project over my belt and just use the needle to pin it in place and I just had it to go whenever I wanted when I was helping out at Unravel this weekend so I love it um, these are the I'll show you the projects that I've worked on just for so you can get a bit of an understanding of how quickly you can improve on this and the first bit I did is really quite funny uh, <laughs> Uh, but we all start somewhere and I have this project that makes me giggle that is still it's a usable item but it's just funny um, so when we were away well before we went away I figured out how to do this stitch and this down here was the first bit I ever did and then I got looser and more relaxed and then I got a bit tighter and then I did this top bit at night uh, so it, I could just finish it uh, it's a it's a little foam bag but it was very handy when we were at, at Midgard's Blot which was the Viking folk metal festival we went to recently um, so I didn't have to take a bag out with me I could just take my phone on my purse and that was it here it is you can see the the stitches in all their <laughs> glory So all I did for this was made a chain long enough for how wide I wanted it, joined it in the round and just kept going until I was happy. I then worked a little bit flat, which I figured out on the fly so it is a bit janky. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't use my phone, I was trying to conserve battery even though I didn't need to. Um, and then I just tucked this in and that was fine, fine enough. I added some tassels for fun and then I just did a like a twisted braid where you twist lengths of yarn together in one direction, fold it in half and then twist it in the opposite. So it's thick enough, like a little bit of rope. Um, but you can see even here, it has a bias still. It wants to twist. And I do want to know if this is just the York stitch or if you know a few of the stitches are like this and some of the other stitches are maybe actually have the bias the other way and some are flat so I'm quite excited to explore that but this one was a bit janky and while I'm gonna use it uh, maybe not for my phone um, it is usable but I decided to cast on it's the phrasing with nail binding knit on 
not on, needle bound on, now bind on. Uh, either way, I cast on another one and I actually started in a circle this time and increased out to the, the width that I wanted. And then I knotted a tube all the way up, worked flat having just, I didn't check how to do it, um, just using instinct and I did it a lot better. Um, and then I did a little crochet loop and a crochet button, which is very cute to do the top bit. And then I just attached an 11 strand braid. This was using lovely Mary's Masham, but this is, I can't remember what fiber it is. I think it is a piece fleece. It was from an advent that I, like an advent swap I did with uh, some knitting podcasters. We all got put with different people and sent out little minis of yarns that we'd used or other treats. It was really nice. So this is quite special. Some of this went into a knitting project and the last of it is kind of used in this. This was a new to me uh, craft too. It is, there's a few little places where it's not perfect but super fun super easy and a really useful tool to have in your toolbox again for making braids on the go or uh, belts quite handy if you forget to take your belt away with you you can whip up a belt on the go bring that closer so you can have a look Everything that I have worked with so far has been in the York Stitch and I think there's a couple of reasons why it clicked more for me. Um, one, just being it's a very simple stitch to do. I wanted to try, start with the Oslo Stitch but I tried it a couple of times and it just didn't feel in instinctual to me and I'm, it might be because the methods I saw all used the thumb and it seems like not using the thumb comes more instinctually to me. Um, but I also think it was because it kind of had a little bit of a special meaning, which I do believe helps when you're learning a pro like when you're learning a new skill. So if you're just starting to knit and you get given some needles and some yarn and someone shows you how to do a scarf, um, you know, garter or stockinette scarf, I don't think it's that joyful and unless you're really really wanting a scarf it's a lot of work for something that you're not truly invested in whereas if someone's you know you talk to a, a more experienced knitter and then you go through patterns and you're like I really want to make that hat like that's 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 something that I would love to wear and own and then you buy a fiber that you really love knowing that you can just rip it out and start again if if it goes wrong or you can put a lifeline in um, so you've got a safety net to a certain point if you're starting to change technique. You, you're more, you know, you've got more oomph and energy to do it. And I think because we went to we went to Jorvik Viking Centre in York, and the York Stitch was found at the Coppergate dig there, and I got to see the sock in person. That you know that this is kind of from it kind of instinctively gave me that like connection and that like yeah that's that's what I want to try and do f to get going now I ended up also doing shoes which I'll talk about in the future from a copper gate find so that was quite cool it all comes together it's all kind of geographically and from the same place which is quite cool and that might only be my shoes and bag but I think that's a good and, and I know that uh, this is not going to be a historically accurate <laughs> phone case. I don't think they would have been carrying that. <laughs> Maybe like seashells. I'm joking. I know Vikings didn't use seashells to talk to each other. I'm just being silly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go in the bin. I will put in some footage of 
uh, the Jorvik Viking Center. I haven't used it yet, so it'll be quite fun to just put that in, show you what that's like. Um, but they, whilst the main attraction was really good, it's, it's quite, it's a little like a, like a ride. If you've ever been to the Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh, it's much like that, but you're going through a Viking village and seeing all of the trinkets and the, it, it was fantastic. But the bit that kind of got me really hard was the amount of textiles that they found. And so this is kind of from memory. Um, the dig started, I want to say in 1972, where they dug some trenches under a Lloyds bank uh, and ended up finding some bits. And then from 1976 to 1981, there was a nine meter excavation maybe over a thousand meters I want to say I love numbers um it's a big a big amount and most of it was viking age but while while there was finds of all kinds of different things the textiles are just amazing the socks the shoes the in fact there as you go in and if you ever go you'll see it it's very clear there is a glass panel over some of the the dug grounds and you can see where someone spilt a madder dye pot and that's like a thousand years old and you can still see the colour and it's just to me that boggles my brain a little and gets me very excited so yes there was lots of organic items there and I think that's well worth a look at look at and a little read if you're interested I will put in the footage from the Viking Centre at the end so you can have a little moment with it. Um, but in the meantime, the item that I've just finished that made me really happy is a hat. I can't believe I made a, an actual wearable thing. Very simple. I will show you how I cast on in the round. I used Ram Jam by Daughter of a Shepherd. I've been talking about it loads recently, but because it's been out and because it is a woolen spun walk and commercially made fibre, it's been quite easy to use. It was a bit too hot and weird at Unravel to get it to felt together nicely, but I, I did it anyway. Um, and also this is scoured and spun in Yorkshire, so it seemed right for a York stitched hat. Um, lovely fibre. And I also used this, which is Kelvin Woolen's Scout. Uh, this this was again just because I wanted to do a black hat, but I wanted it to be a little bit grey and heathery, and it's just something that I had. And yeah, I made a chain, joined it in the round, then I knotted up until I was ready to do some decreases, did some decreases until the very top. I didn't do it too tightly. Um, so I, I, I didn't go down to like four stitches. I actually went down to about eight because I prefer a slightly rounder, less pointy hat in general. This maybe is a touch too small, but I'm going to wear it still quite a bit. And actually Alex looks really good in it too. Um, it's slightly different to knitting because it doesn't have quite as much stretch. It won't really, it's got more stretch lengthways than widthways, um, which I think is quite interesting. And what was I going to say? So really you can just make something fit and it will just fit. It won't, while the fibres will relax when you wash them, it won't like block out huge, at least from my understanding so far. <laughs> And this was, I have to say, inspired by lovely Chloe, who is Chloe Couscous on Instagram, if you want to go and have a little look. Sorry, Chloe, if I hope you don't mind me plugging you. It's not plugging you, but you can see the gorgeous hat that Chloe was wearing at uh, Midgard's block um, when I, when I got, <laughs> got to meet her, which was really, really nice. It, it was so cute. It had a grey brim like this and a blue body to the hat. And kind of goes into a little gentle point that just hangs back a little bit and that's what I was going to do initially but when I realized this was slightly smaller than 
would work for that kind of style. I thought, you know what, I'm probably going to wear a hat that fits better more than a hat that's cute. I would love to make another one, but I'm going to wait a little bit and spend some time talking to Anders, who actually made the hat for Chloe. He is Nordic Noob Knits and has some gorgeous patterns. I'm hoping to knit one of his jumpers very soon, but I'm gonna ask about the rates of decreases or increases depending how he did his top up or bottom down so that I can hopefully learn and mimic that hat because it's gorgeous and so cute. And I think it will be perfect for like a December hat. It's like, it, it would be very festive without being like, hey, you know, so. I'm really happy with this and I'm glad that I've been able to make an item that I can really use and have every day or maybe if we do more Viking reenactment. But anyway, I've spoken enough. Let's get now banding. So I'm going to use this uh, Lopi because it should be chunky enough and contrasty enough with the table and my needle to show what I'm doing, fingers crossed. Um, and it's got less of a twist um, applied to it, so it should be quite easy to felt together. So working with about one and a half of your arm's length to begin with, you could use more. Um, and I tend to use it two arm lengths when I am doing it myself. But I think to start off with, it's easier to use something a bit less cumbersome. And to, I just instinctively did that. But to break it, especially with the low peak, the easiest way to do it is to hold the your thumb in one hand and using the opposite finger and thumb pinch and slightly untwist the yarn. So whatever way the yarn is spun, just go opposite and then it should fluff apart and you've got these lovely ends to felt together. I'll put that one aside for now. And then we're going to thread the needle and like I said this is just the way I do it there's so many methods and so many great teachers out there it's worth spending some time with them I'm about learning and showing you how easy it is and hopefully giving you the confidence to try things rather than you know being the expert to teach you so I tend to make two loops so with the tail in my finger and thumb on my left hand allow the right hand to take it over. You've got one loop, squishing it down with the left finger and thumb. I'm doing exactly the same again, so you've got two, and then bringing them on top of one another, so you've kind of got three loops. It kind of looks like a heart. So now you've got those three holes in between the two loops. You're gonna take the needle from behind, keeping the tail down, I'm going to bring the needle from behind through the centre stitch, bring it up and allow it to loop round. Make that third loop on your in between your hands about the same size as the previous two. Like I said, you could use your thumb to gauge it, I don't. Um, check that you've got enough yarn to work with by making sure that you've got this tail isn't going to get trapped in because that's very frustrating when that happens. Um, and then you're going to count the two loops back. So you've got the end one that was created from the stitch you just made. And then the next one over was from the second loop you made. And you can go in between those two. Bring it up and through. And again, make that loop about the same size as the loop you just made. And you're gonna just keep doing that. So going through not the, the loop that you've just made, but the next one, and bringing the needle through, up, make the loop pinch. And we're just gonna keep going like this until we've got the length that we want. But I think I'm going to join it in the round. 
and again this is just the method that I use it's not necessarily the correct way so I'm going to check that there's no twists because it does want to get twisty and I'm going to lay the last the the I'm going to place the two stitches that I just finished on top of the first two that I created. And I'm going to go through the tops of the first two stitches that I created, and then back through the last two stitches I created, and count the last two stitches, so one, two. And I'm gonna check that my tail goes underneath and over the top and then I'm going to pull through and we have join in the round because this is the first round of a circle I'm going to work this stitch twice into every stitch so I'm going to go back into those first two stitches I worked and then into the last two stitches that I worked checking that the tail goes over and pulling through. And I'm going to turn my work a little bit. I'm going to find the next two stitches, one, two, and then I'm going to come back through the next two. So that'll be one, two. You can see that the tail is from is in the third stitch over. So you're going to go to one stitch after that through these two yarn over to start working on your tension if you want to use the needle like I do once you've got the needle at its thickest part or wherever you want to tension it the thickest part makes sense because you're going to pull it through um, just give it a little tug and it will neaten up that stitch for you pull it through and then because we're doing it two stitches to increase I'm going to go through those same two stitches and then back through the last two one two pull through, tails over, that is the orc stitch. And we're going to keep going around until we're back to the beginning. So I am going to work this as I would a, a crochet circle. I increasing to the point where I'm happy with the width of the item or the circumference. So I'm going to, on the first round, I've increased in every single stitch to double the amount of stitches. On the next round, I'm going to increase every other stitch. Then on the next round, every third stitch, the next round, every fourth stitch, and so on. Uh, and then I'm just going to knit in a tube until I'm happy. Um, just sh just to show you, I'm not going to, I don't have anything in particular in mind that I'm going to make, just just a little swatch to show you how, how to work this and I will get to a point where it's easier hopefully for you to read what I am doing. To join, um, you just use your favourite splicing method if you have one, if not check which end is kind of the fluffiest. And you can get away without using any water sometimes or a little spit or a little bit of water and just give it a little rub together. There's different methods. You could be more thorough in going with the twist of the fabric. That does tend to help. I find that a little bit of chaotic movements um, tend to help it be a bit more secure, but that's just from experience. And then Thread your needle again and off you go. just it really but 
I'll show you once I've got a bit more on on a slightly wider bit the same thing just the simple York stitch in case you need to see that again I think it's lovely obviously I'm sitting a bit weird so it's not as good for my posture or my wrists but hopefully it means that you can see it see what I'm doing To decrease, you would go through not just the stitch that you're going through next, but the one after, much like a knit two together and pick up the three strands and then go back to, and that will give you a decreased stitch. Um, I won't do it now, but that is the method so that you know how to do it. in York stitch anyway. That's it. That is that is needle binding. And once you're done, you just weave in the end. You don't need to finish it because it's there are no live stitches. You just weave in the end and you you're done. So I have increased until actually the width of just wider than my foot in the hope that this could be Alex's first sort of slipper sock project. Whether I continue it or he does or we both do a bit, I'm not sure, but I think it's more useful to try and create something useful so we're going to aim for that. Um, it is, I maybe could have gone for a larger amount of stitches to begin with but I actually think once it's on it will be fine. I've tried it on my foot but that's where we're at. I'll show you again a few times just the stitch so you can see it and then and then we'll maybe go off to the Orvik Centre together if you want to have a little stay around and have a little look and I will check in with this project in the future when it's done um, and continue doing it and hopefully do some more experiments learn some more stitches and yeah if you have anything that you were that you've worked on any projects that you've done any tips feel free to share them I think the best thing about having started this space has been the community aspect and the learning together um, I feel like I learned loads this weekend I met a few people that I met in real life previously, uh, a few people I've spoken to online for years and have never had the opportunity to meet and just swapping, you know, fibre chat, spinning chat, knitting chat has been so nice. Uh, so the more we can do that, the better, I think. I'll show you again. So pick up the next two loops through the last two you worked. Snug it up if you want. This is really easy to work with. Um, I do recommend if you've got some lopey kicking around, it's easy to splice, it wants to stick together, it actually wants to get to about the right size and it kind of all felts together. It's really, really good. So two, and then two. Before it gets too small, I will splice them all together. I'm gonna run out of this yarn. They're not gonna be a. They're gonna be sisters, not twins. And as you can see, working at this gauge at this tension with this yarn uh, these now bind up so quickly like it's not a slow project it, it's a great one to I'd imagine to get younger younger ones doing or those that you know don't if you can't hold your attention for very long just working you know two arms went length of yarn and then calling it a day for a bit you know it could even be a really um, useful way of working the pomodoro method so taking a break 
every set amount of time, maybe once an hour, maybe once every half an hour, and just working a length of yarn, just as a way of getting up from the computer. It's easy enough to work stood up if you need to have a stand up break, sitting down, like it's quite, it's quite a good way of breaking, breaking down a project into something for breaking down the day. You know, in knitting you could do one row, but then you kind of maybe just want to keep going. Whereas with this, you're like, you have to commit to splicing it together to keep going. So it's a bit easier to go, okay, I'm done for now. I'll come back to it later. But yeah, anyway, I am waffling. I hope you in, I hope you enjoyed this. Maybe you learned something, maybe you didn't. Um, maybe you're inspired to try this. Maybe you've realized it's not for you. But either way, I hope it's been useful and uh, yeah, I hope to see you again very soon. Such as matter, well, wool, and dyes green, all used to create shades of red, yellow, blue, and green. Violet and coloured clothes will surely brighten up the streets of all Thank you.